Uh, cool, big crowd. Welcome everybody to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And tonight is going to be part four of our look at this Manifestation of Lights Sutra. Um, if you weren't here for some reason or haven't caught up on part one, two, and three, never a problem. Each night here at the Dharma Doors is kind of a standalone in that way. Um, I kind of have a, a theme that we're going to talk about tonight. We are going to read another section of the sutra. Um, I have a little bit of business to take, like to catch up on from last time. So last time I, you know, read and went through um, a very long section of about 60 verses. And there was a really interesting part at the end of last time. And that's where I want to start. Um, a quick note, though, too, you know, this sutra is it's an obscure little sutra. Um, I, uh, you know, I went through the, the various sources in the first episode or the first of these, so I'm not going to do that again. But in our standard English translation of this sutra, um, in this book, A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, you know, I mentioned, I think, at the opening night that this uh, their translation of this sutra, it's full of um, lacuna, for back of, <laughs> lack of a better term. It's uh, full of these parts that they just don't translate. And the more I go through this, the, this is like one of the worst I've encountered in this book, where it's not only that they're removing sections, but it's just so haphazard that if you really wanted to read this sutra, you really couldn't read it. Uh, from this English version. Um, and so, although I will be referring a little bit to this tonight, I'm going to mainly be reading from the translation I've been working on because it includes these missing sections. So just a note about that, that there's a lot of missing sections if you're referring to this, the, the Chang uh, translation. So the where I want to start tonight again is from a, a little thing that happened at the end of last time. And I read from my translation last time. And to be honest, my translation is very rough at the moment. But the way that that section last Sunday, the way that it, it went was it was uh, again, this is the manifestation of lights. And so the Buddha is describing to the, the little boy Moonlight, or the little boy na named Moonlight, he's describing all of these different lights. And in the section I read last time, it was about uh, a series of verses, again, about 60 of them. And it was about, I have the Buddha saying, I have a light called, and then a certain name, and then a kind of a description of how he achieved that light, right? So I, the very, one of the last ones we read was, I have a light called praise or honor. It is praised or honored by all Buddha Tathagatas. And this light was achieved as a result of being ever reverent of the Dharma. So that was one kind of the way last time read, but then we came to this section that said, it was about the Buddha eye. And the way that I read the section was about, and I'm you know, translating this sort of very verbatim, very literally from the Chinese. So it talks about how the kinds of sentient beings or the sentient beings that are seen by the Buddha's eye or just the Buddha eye, it says that the Buddha from a single hair pour emits a shield of light. And each of those lights has a retinue of lights, each appearing in accord with the thoughts of the minds of all sentient beings, covering them in Buddha light, ripening them to maturity. So that's how I translated it. Just to let you know, the standard English translation reads, each pore of the Buddha gives forth lights. 
as numerous as the sentient beings within his sight. And each of these lights is surrounded by its own retinue of lights. Blessed or blessed by these Buddha lights, sentient beings are brought to maturity, each in accordance with their inclinations. So, you know, kind of similar, a little bit here and there. The thing that this translation really misses, though, is that this is a little verse that's about the Buddha eye. And they, I would not translate it the way that they translate it because they describe it as um, all the sentient beings within the Buddha's sight. And that might seem like it's kind of very, you know, slight difference. The thing about it is, though, is that the Buddha eye is like an idea. It's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing within Buddhism. And so I want to start tonight by talking about that idea of the Buddha eye so that we can make a little bit better sense of this little section or this little verse. And then we're going to read this new section. So if you haven't heard of the Buddha eye, it is uh, usually it, within the world of Buddhism, particularly Mahayana Buddhism, there is this idea of the five eyes, five different eyes. And when I, before I tell you about these eyes, I want you to know that there's a, a word or a term or an idea within the world of Buddhism called an indriya. In Sanskrit, it would be called an indriya. And that word is normally translated into English as a faculty. And within the world of philosophy, like if you go back to like Kant, like Kantian philosophy, a lot of philosophy is really interested in faculties. And what exactly is a faculty? Well, the idea is it's sort of like a certain kind of an ability, a faculty, an ability to do something. And what I mean is, is this, take for example, seeing. The eyeball is the organ. But the idea is, is though, is that you could have the physical eyeball, but you could be blind. Meaning that it, you have the organ, you have the thing, but you don't have the faculty. You don't have the ability to see. You've got an eyeball, but it doesn't work. And so you don't have the faculty. So what I'm getting at is, is that the idea of a faculty as an ability, it's a, it's a slightly different than the organ. Similarly, you may have 10 fingers, but can you play the piano? Do you have the faculty, this sort of ability to do that? So in other words, there's kind of a very intimate relationship between this, the organ, whether it's the body or the eyes or the ears, these things, there's an intimate relationship between the organ and the faculty or the ability to do something, but they're not one in the same. Similarly, there's a way in which like playing the piano that you sort of might need to work on that. You might not just sort of step up to a piano the first time and start playing. You might need to cultivate or develop that faculty or that ability. What I'm getting at is, is that these five eyes that I'm about to describe are indrias in that sense. They're considered faculties and they may or may not, and I would lean towards may not, they may or may not correspond to an actual organ. But my point is, is that regarding all five of these eyes that I'm about to describe, they are faculties that human beings in particular have. But you may not have cultivated your all five of these faculties yet, is what I'm getting at. So the five eyes are, the first is called the physical eye, which is literally your your eyeball in your, your eyeball socket and used to see kind of physical light in that way, terrestrial light, photonic light, reflective light in that sense. So that's just regular old eyeballs, number one. 
Number two, they call the divine eye or the deva eye. Uh, the heavenly eye is another way to describe or to, to translate this. So the divine eye or the deva eye in most traditions sort of corresponds to the third eye. Buddhism doesn't, at least most forms of Buddhism don't really talk a lot about the third eye. You see the third eye a lot in Buddhist iconography where various bodhisattvas will actually have a third eye. You might see bodhisattvas with eyes on the palms of their hands and on the palms of their feet too. So the divine eye is a faculty and what one sees with the divine eye, well, you know, it sort of depends upon the source you're looking at, but mainly the divine eye can see kind of ghosts, past lives, future lives a little bit. The English word for the divine eye would actually be clairvoyance. Clear seeing is what clairvoyance means to be clairvoyant is literally clearly seeing. And so even in English, when we say clairvoyance, we're referring to a type of seeing. That's what that word literally means is clearly seeing. And so interesting that when we think of, you know, fortune tellers or people with sort of um, a sixth sense in the, in the Western sense of that idea of a sixth sense, that's the divine eye. Not, not unique to Buddhism per se in that sense. Many traditions have that idea of people who have this faculty, who have this ability to see the other side as it's sometimes called. Again, the idea is that we all have that faculty or that ability, but some developed more than others. Just like some of us can play the piano very well and some of us can't, some of us are inclined to the divine eye or that clairvoyance. The third eye is usually called the wisdom eye. And the wisdom eye is a specific type of eye, a specific type of seeing, and it's called the wisdom eye. So it seems in terms of wisdom. If you go back to part one of this sutra, I spoke at length about light and ideas about light. And what I spoke a lot about that first session was the light of knowledge and how learning something can sort of illuminate a situation where you know things and now see things that you weren't able to see before. And you're not seeing with your physical eye, you're not seeing ghosts with, with your divine eye, but you may be able to sort of understand things. And specifically the wisdom eye understands or sees, if you will, everything in terms of emptiness, shunyata. That's kind of the defining characteristic of the wisdom eye. Understanding and knowing the illusory or empty kind of nature of all phenomena in that way. And therefore sort of being able to see, I don't want to say, say see through it, but definitely in a sense, not being tricked by it in that way. So that's the third eye, the wisdom eye. And I'll give you an analogy for the wisdom eye, but let me give you the fourth eye and then we'll go back real quick and talk about the wisdom eye as it pertains to this next one. So the fourth eye in this Buddhist tradition is called the Dharma eye, sometimes called the eye of reality, but that's a weird translation of Dharma as real or true. Not exactly, especially within Mahayana Buddhism, you would wanna shy away from defining Dharma as real or true. It's sort of a non-dual idea beyond real and not real beyond true and false in that sense. But the Dharma eye is the eye. And again, this is not the physical eyes. This is not the divine eye. This is not the wisdom eye. This is the Dharma eye that sees 
all phenomena in terms of dharmas, which is to kind of say, understands their arising and ceasing, understands their phenomenal arising and ceasing, understands their dharmic nature. So let me give you quickly just a way to think about those, uh, those two different ones. Uh, there's actually, there's two different analogies I could go with. There's the matrix one using the movie, or there's the dream one. They're kind of very similar. Um, I'll use the dream one because not everybody has seen the movie, whereas everybody's had a dream, hopefully. And so the idea here is, is that when, when I, especially when I use the dream analogy, I'm always sort of toggling back and forth between a dream where you think it's reality. <laughs> so you don't know you're dreaming. And so you, it kind of mistake it for reality in that way. So I like to contrast that to a dream where you either are lucid and aware that it is a dream, or we're talking about right after you wake up and you remember, oh yeah, that was just a dream. The analogy though of these eyes is, well, the physical eye is sort of tricky within the, this analogy, just because it's an analogy. So let's hold off on, on the regular old physical eye and let's even hold off on the divine eye for a minute. I just want to kind of share what the difference is between the wisdom eye and the Dharma eye. So if you were to become lucidly aware in a dream, you would then be like, oh, this is just a dream. Oh, this stuff isn't real. It's all going to disappear in a second in that way when I wake up. So it's, it doesn't have the tangible physical reality that I thought it did a second ago when I wasn't lucid, when I wasn't having a lucid dream and it was a regular old dream. I thought this stuff was real and I, I could like hoard it and sell it and do all kinds of things with it. But I've just realized I'm dreaming. And so I kind of now can see how all of this is not real it's empty in that sense so that's in a dream but my point is is that that's similar to the wisdom eye the wisdom eye is the one that wakes up regarding the empty or illusory nature of this reality world and sees this reality world similar to that lucid dreamer where they understand, oh, all of this is a phenomenal kind of magic show in a way. That is different than the eye, the Dharma eye, that would not only understand that everything in that dream was quote unquote, not real, Remember, that's the, that's the providence of the wisdom eye, to know things are not really real in that way. The Dharma eye, though, is the eye that basically, if I just summarize it, it's the eye that knows why they're having that dream. What is the exact psychological background that is making me have this exact dream that looks exactly like this. And, you know, if it was like, um, whatever, uh, let's say I had, I was having a dream where I was at a swimming pool and then I became lucidly aware that it was a dream. And I was like, oh, this isn't a real swimming pool. This isn't a real situation. This is a dream. So that's the wisdom eye. The Dharma eye would know exactly why they were dreaming about a swimming pool. From, from whence did that idea come from? Why that idea? That's a much subtler eye, the Dharma eye, that understands kind of the really deep inner workings of this reality. It's one thing to just understand that it's sort of illusory in that way. It's a whole other thing to understand exactly why it's appearing like this. So that's the Dharma eye. 
So seeing the world in terms of dharmas. So for example, dharmas being things like the three poisons or the three kleshas, greed, anger, and delusion. We human beings are wanty, we are fearful and angry of things, and we're confused. And there's actually a way in which just understanding those three kleshas, if you really understand those dharmas really deeply, you can understand a lot of your own behavior and a lot of other people's behavior, because at the, at the end, we're all actually operating from those three places. Gimme, gimme, gimme. Ah, ah, get away. And wait, what's going on here? Gimme, gimme, gimme. Get away. What's going on here? Just around and around. And if you kind of understand that that's the deeper programming here, you can kind of begin to understand why everybody's doing what they're doing and why you're doing what you're doing. So that's the Dharma eye, a very profound eye. And again, it's a faculty. It's an ability that needs to be cultivated to see the world that way. And then the fifth eye is the Buddha eye, the eye of a fully enlightened being the eye of a fully awakened being, a Buddha. Now, there's actually not, or I have yet to find a lot of detailed information about what constitutes the Buddha eye. I can give you the basics. The basics are that, well, <laughs> the basics would be, well, if I needed to just summarize it, it has to do with omniscience. It has to do with all knowingness. And how is it that one could possibly be in a state of all knowing of omniscience? Well, a few of the characteristics are definitely an eye. So this is a Buddha eye. This is the Buddha eye. So it's still a way of seeing. But the seeing, one of the characteristics or one of the qualities of this Buddha eye is that it is beyond time and space. So in, for us, we are anchored in time. This is the present, and the present is relative to the past that happened before it, and it's relative to the future that's coming quickly after it. <laughs> Never really, it's really just right there, right? So we, we kind of move in this time frame of now, before, and after. There's a lot of interesting things I could say about the arising of that sense of time and the way it, the, it relates to that sense of self, that attachment to the sense of self as being in a specific place at a specific time, that it's kind of really bound up together. Again, what I'm saying is, is that the, the idea of self, the notion of self and the notion of time are very, very bound up together, co-creating each other in a sense. Buddhas, fully awakened beings, being beyond that idea of self, are therefore, by, you know, but as a logical consequence of not having that attachment to self, are also not stuck in time and not stuck in space, by which I mean a location. So the Buddha eye is seeing from a very different vantage point than actually what I would what I would want to say is, is that the Buddha eye is seeing from a very different vantage point than the other four eyes. And what I mean is the other four eyes are still gonna be very, you know, you centered in that way from your axis in space and time looking out. And so you're either seeing the world in terms of its physicality, seeing the world in terms of kind of a metaphysicality for lack of a better expression for the ghostly realm, you're seeing the world in terms of emptiness, seeing the world in terms of dharmas, or seeing the world in terms of kind of awakening, that awakened state. If you're still a little confused about the Buddha eye, it's okay because 
I just I just went through all of that only to get back to this little section of the sutra. So this little section of the sutra is dealing with that idea of the Buddha eye. And before I kind of dive back into the sutra, I just want to say one more thing about this manifestation of lights sutra. In part one, I talked a lot about lights, like lamps, the sun, you know, I probably didn't mention neon and halogen, but you know, the whole gambit of all these kinds of like lights. And what I was talking about in that opening session was about the relationship between light and knowledge. Like, and literally in the sense that if you were in a dark room, you wouldn't know what was in the room. But if you turned on a light, you would know what was in the room. So light, knowledge, there's a, this relationship between those two. And then we get this introduction of the Buddha eye, which like I was just going through is part of this five eyes thing. So in other words, it is only the first eye, the physical eye, that depends upon lamps and neon and the sun and all of these other lights. It's only the physical eye that needs those kinds of lights. But the point of all of these manifestation of lights, a, a light called honor, a light called charity, a light called this, a light called that, all of these lights that this sutra is going through, these are not lights that would be perceived by the physical eye. They are other types of lights, or at least they are being described as lights. And so what I want you to kind of start to think about is, the, 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 I guess I just this kind of really interesting um, set of metaphors, primarily the one of eyeballs, light, and knowledge. But the idea that these eyeballs and lamplight lead to a certain type of knowledge. But these other four eyes, they're eyeballs, or I shouldn't call them eyeballs, they're eyes. They are faculties of seeing, but they're not using lamplight. They're requiring or they're dependent upon other forms of light. So now, and I'm just going to read this, the English one again. This one regarding the way the Buddha sees. So the way the Buddha eye works. The sutra says, each hair pore of the Buddha's body gives forth lights as numerous as the sentient beings within the Buddha's sight. And each of those lights is surrounded by its own retinue of lights. Blessed by these Buddha lights, sentient beings are brought to maturity, each in accordance with their inclinations. So that's sort of this theme that you will see a lot in Mahayana Buddha sutras. And it's the theme of the hair pores of the Buddha's body emitting light. And it's in, in that regard that the eye of the Buddha or the Buddha eye sees sentient beings in that way. This is, if this sounds wild and out there, it's supposed to, this is, this is out there type of stuff, okay? This is a very out there kind of a sutra. And so I really think that it's really sort of not meant to be super clearly understood in that. I mean, it, it's meant to be clearly understood, but it's, it doesn't have this really direct way of being understood. It's so poetic is my is my point you know if, if you know what i mean you know they they have that saying about funk music 
Like what, what is funk music? Well, you'll know it when you feel it. It's like, there's no, you just know. And it's like, that's kind of like this. There's no, there's a way of fully understanding this, but it's very subtle. All right, on that note, before we go any further, because I do want to get to the fun new part tonight. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas about light, five eyes? Does, uh, does the sutra go into cultivation at all of the faculties or no? No, and actually, Annette, your question is a perfect one in terms of like, how is this sutra working? Like, or like, what's the teaching like? So like all the Dharma doors, like all, every Sunday night, I, I rarely know where these are going. I have rarely even read these sutras beforehand. This is one that I read probably years ago. And I was like, oh, the lights, that's a cool one. Let's do that one. But as I read deeper and actually I'm now reading the Chinese and translating it, I have a better understanding of it. And something that's kind of occurred to me recently is this all starts with this little boy, a little boy named Moonlight. And, you know, it, this is just, again, this is just something that's kind of come to me from reading this, but the one thing that I wanted to mention, I think it was last week, was that this sutra, it's almost like a bedtime story. And, and, I, and as I was reading last week, it felt like a bedtime story to me in that way. Tonight is like super bedtime story. And when I thought of that when I was like, yeah, it, the way this sutra works, it's almost just like a bedtime story. It doesn't really have this really heavy description of practice. You're just listening. You're just actually having these lights sort of wash over you. And then I kind of was like, oh yeah, and this is being, this is a sutra for a little boy. And it's a little boy named Moonlight. I mean, you know, not, maybe I'm projecting like good night moon, type of things onto this, but there's just something in which the sutra has this really gentle, poetic kind of quality to it in that way. So yeah, Annette, it's not gonna really tell us about how to cultivate these faculties, at least not in any explicit way. It's gonna be much more Im implied and implicit. Okay, so the thing, I mentioned this last time, this sutra, the Buddha's response to Moonlight's question, which is, Buddha, how did you get all these different lights? And then the Buddha has been giving his answer, and he has been giving his answer in, in poetic verse, as the Buddha kind of always does. And I mentioned that the, the sutra, which is a very long sutra, the Buddha changes his... Um, meter he changes the poetic structure and the changes in the poetic structure signal shifts in the story it's a very kind of interesting thing that goes on and so this shift it's already starts to happen and then the buddha changes his his uh his rhyme scheme and the meter but I want to read you this part because it's kind of, it, it's a foreshadowing. So after the interesting verse about the pores of the Buddha emitting light, and that's how the eye of the Buddha sees, it says, if someone hears of these lights explained, and they are able to bring forth pleasant delight and profound joy, this person must have already heard this sutra from a Buddha in the past. So that's an interesting little line there. <clears throat> and it's about to become very, very relevant to the passage I'm going to read tonight. But it's not uh, unique to this sutra. And what it is, it's two things, two things going on. The one thing we're going to talk about tonight is the way that a lot of these Mahayana Buddha sutras are aware of themselves and like talk about themselves. So 
again, I, I'm reading a sutra and it says if someone hears this sutra and they are delighted and it brings them joy, it's because they must have heard it before in a past life, basically from an, a previous Buddha. So there's two things again going on. One is that the sutra is talking about itself. And I want to men- I want to talk about that, that, that self-referential nature of Mahayana sutras. And then the other thing that it's doing is this really kind of, it's a little weird, but it's this idea that if, if, if this sutra is appealing to you, it's because you've already heard it before in a past life from a different Buddha. So this is getting a little weird is all I want to say. Like, it's kind of like, wait, whoa, what? Hold on. So then the Buddha goes on and actually it, I didn't catch this the first time. So I'm going to try to emphasize certain words here. So then after this statement, the Buddha makes that you must have heard this one before. He says, I have a light called supreme. It's retinue, it's surrounding lights, total 80 kotis. And a koti is about a million. So 80 million rays of light surround this light called supreme. This light was achieved as a result of praising the Buddha with a single verse. I have a light called without distress. Its retinue of lights totals 80 nayuttas, which is like a hundred million. This light was achieved as a result of retaining the Dharma spoken by a single Buddha. I have a light called victorious purity. Its retinue of lights totals 80 million. This light was achieved as a result of being able to retain a single samadhi state. And then this is where it shifts meter. In the past, there was a Buddha known as Supreme. The world in which that Buddha abided, in the world in which that Buddha abided, the lifespan was immeasurable. Upon first attaining the way, that Buddha's Dharma, Dharma assembly contained 80 nayuttas of individuals. At that time, like this, in Jambudvipa, there was a king of a country whose name was Joyful Voice. This king also had 500 princely sons, all handsome, upright, pleasing to all who saw them. At this time, their father, the king, meritorious and sovereign, had just developed faith in the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And the king had these magnificently adorned gardens and offered them all to the Buddha, the world honored one. Within these gardens were places for sutra recitation. There were also incalculable numbers of magnolia trees, kampaka trees, banyan trees, kimshuka trees, udumbara trees, paramita trees, and also shirisha trees, the tree without distress. In all, there were 80 kotis, 80 million of each. All the trees of such renowned glory, in the winter or the summer, their flowers and fruit, branches and leaf, the light of each was lustrous, giving off a wondrous scent, perfuming the body of the Buddha. All the bhikshus, their bodies were the color of gold, each one sitting underneath a different tree, strong and determined, attaining dharanis. At that time, the Buddha, out of pity for the king, 
and for the king's sons and those in the great assembly, that Buddha preached just like this, the Manifestation of Lights Sutra. Upon hearing it, the king's heart was joyful and he praised the Tathagata with countless verses. The king also, with 80 kotis, 80 million of the most wonderful jeweled canopies, made offerings to the Buddha. Each jeweled canopy with wish-fulfilling mani gem stones, its netting meticulously surrounded and draped with ornaments. These mani jewel ornaments, the value of each was 80 millions worth of Jambu River gold. And each of these canopies had 80 kutis, 80 millions of jeweled wish-fulfilling gems as tassels. The color of these wish-fulfilling mani jewels was lustrous and clear, whether day or night, always luminous. Each light beam of those jewels extended 100 leagues. The radiance of these lights outshone the sun and the moon. These canopies were also made of 80 million lion jeweled belts, 80 kotis, 80 millions of gold threaded jeweled garland wreaths and all kinds of adornments. There were also all kinds of wonderful rare colored pearls inlaid and adorned with nets of gems and treasures of truth. With canopies like this, meticulously manicured gardens, so great, also containing sumana flowers, atimuttaka flowers, udumbara flowers, pure lotuses, and more. Like this, all kinds of immeasurable flowered canopies, each completely covered in jeweled nets. There were also millions of gold-threaded jeweled cloth covering the silk tops of the canopies. The canopies also had golden bases with beds made of sandalwood, their numbers also 80 million. These beds were exquisite with silk cushions and silk mattresses all gloriously adorned. At that time, all sentient beings, even up to those having attained anointment, all came and gathered where the Buddha, the Tathagata, what all had gathered where the Buddha Tathagata was to hear this sutra spoken. Devas, Nagas, Yakshas, Gandharava kings, Mahuragas, Asuras, and more, having heard this sutra, gave rise to joyful hearts. With hundreds of thousands of verses, they praised the thus come one, all of them generating the will for enlightenment. All the devas and nagas and other gods, and also the asuras, with pure hearts, all rained down mandarava flowers, pearls of truth and other jewels, giving them as offerings. At that time, there were also 80 million great, majestic, powerful gods. Having heard this sutra, their minds delighted and they generated the will for enlightenment. Then the thus come one, the Buddha, knowing the thoughts of these gods' minds, gave the prediction that they would all become Buddhas. At that time, there were also 80 kotis of Chakra Devanam Indras and just as many Brahma gods. Hearing this manifestation of Light Sutra like this, they were also delighted, generated bodhicitta, the will for enlightenment, and received the prediction that they would become Buddhas. At that time, there were also 80 million Nayutas of Nagas 
And upon hearing this sutra, they too generated bodhicitta and were blessed with the prediction. At that time, there were also 80 million Garuda kings who, upon hearing this sutra, firmly held the five precepts and also received their prediction. At that time, there were also 80 million Gandharava kings. Upon hearing this sutra, they brought forth all kinds of beautiful music as offerings to the Buddha and received the prediction. There were also 80 Nayuttas, hundreds of millions of Yaksha kings, who, upon hearing this sutra, by the wisdom of the Buddha, gave rise to profound faith, all of them receiving the prediction of their awakening. Moonlight. You should know that king, joyful voice, who gave all those offerings to the thus come one, was none other than who? It was you. You, in a past time, heard this sutra. And for that reason, today, you ask me again about these lights. If there is someone who, after my parinirvana, my final nirvana, when the Dharma wheel is about to cease turning, if they should bring forth faith from this teaching, then they'll be able to explain a sutra like this. Okay, so that's the section I wanted to read. And now let's talk about it. <laughs> um, anything jump out at anybody right off the top? Anything interesting or? So one, the first thing I'll just start here. So I think it was maybe the second session of this sutra um, that I read uh, part of the Lotus Sutra. So the Sadharma Pundarika Sutra, as it's called, the just called the Lotus Sutra. So I read from that sutra because that's sort of that's sort of the go-to place for the reference regarding the Buddha emitting these, these great lights. Um, now, this sutra, the manifestation of lights, might ultimately be the place to go to find out about the Buddha's manifesting lights. Um, but again, there's not a complete English translation of it. So until then, the Lotus Sutra is a good source. In that sutra, the Buddha too emits a great light. And in that sutra as well, that people inquire about the light. Why is the Buddha emitting light? How did the Buddha get to emit such light? What's going on here? And I read that section about the light from the Lotus Sutra because it has a lot of parallels with this sutra. But what's interesting is, is that when I did that, I, I was only going for the light similarity. It was only once I got to this part of, the, of this sutra, tonight's sutra, where the Buddha pulls this thing, where he, said, he tells this elaborate story about a Buddha from the distant past, and that at that time there was a king named Joyful Voice, and that king gave all these uh, offerings to the Tathagata, to the Buddha called Supreme, and don't you remember Moonlight? That king was you. And the reason why you're asking me about this sutra now is because you heard the sutra already from that Buddha. So that kind of weird kind of past life thing also happens in the Lotus Sutra. It's exactly what happens in the Lotus Sutra where one Bodhisattva is like, wow, where's all this light coming from? And the other, uh, another bodhisattva says, don't you remember? This has happened before. There was a Buddha named Sun, Moon, Bright, and you were called Bodhisattva so-and-so, and I was called Bodhisattva so-and-so, and the Buddha emitted the light. So they're starting, or at least in my mind, I'm starting to sense a 
intimate relationship between the lights, the manifestation of lights, and this kind of past life reference thing. But let's kind of begin to unpack this because I actually think there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of really interesting things going on here. And well, I've mentioned now a couple of times this idea of past lives, right? That it, the sutra seems to be referencing past lives. And it, it may be, and I definitely tonight, I'm only offering an interpretation of this sutra. I'm not um, trying to be definitive about how to understand this. But the idea here is, is this. So I want to go back to something I mentioned, which was the self-awareness of a sutra like this, where we are reading this sutra, and then in this sutra, they talk about this sutra, this manifestation of lights sutra. And so there's this thing that happens that's really kind of weird. And, and again, I want, if you don't know this, or it, this happens a lot in Mahayana Buddhist sutras, where the sutra refers to itself. You don't ever find this in the Pali Canon. So in the early Buddhist suttas, those, those teachings that are preserved in the Pali language, those early teachings are, they do seem to be just records of something somebody said. <laughs> like the Buddha said some stuff and somebody wrote it down. And, and there, this is just a recording of what the Buddha said. These Mahayana sutras are very different. They, you know, even though they begin, thus have I heard, one time the Buddha was in, you know, probably Gridrakuta, right? The vultures on the vulture's peak. They're presented as if they're a historical document, but then they quickly reveal they're not really a historical document that way. And then crazy things start happening and you realize that you're reading a story. And that's where I wanna come back to this idea that this is a sutra like this is kind of a bedtime story in that way. It's functioning very differently than those early sutras that they had information for us. This sutra doesn't particularly have information. It has an experience. And so let's go deeper into that self-referential nature of the sutra. So there's a couple of examples of this in, well, in modern literature, there's a few good examples. Um, the one that comes to the top of my mind, and I'm not the most well-read person in that regard, um, but if you're familiar with the Italian novelist and short storyist Italo Calvino, so Calvino wrote a book called If, if on a Winter's Night a Traveler. And what's interesting about that book is that it's one of not, not too many books in the world that are written in the second person. So it's a novel, Italo Calvino's if, if on a Winter's Night a Traveler, it's a novel, but it's written in the second person. And I was actually trying to dig out a copy so I could read to you from the beginning, but you could imagine that if you read it, it reads something like, you've just found this book on a train and you're now reading this book. And it, so the whole thing is written in the second person. So it's addressing you, the reader. <laughs> and it makes, of course, for a very interesting read when you, the reader, are being implicated in the story, right? It, it, it kind of, it's a very interesting read. And again, there's not a lot of books that are successfully written in the second person. I suggest my suggestion is, is that a lot of these Mahayana sutras are kind of in a form of the second person. And it's not exactly the second person, but it's sort of like the second person. 
And the way that I think of it is, well, actually, let me share this with you. This is kind of a funny, it's either a magic trick or it's modern art or it's just a, a joke. But let me show you this. This is a funny one. So if you're not looking, just look at the screen real quick. So check this one out. So how did I know? How did, how did I know that that would be true? <laughs> right? And what's funny about it is it, it's true every single time. Right? And it's kind of funny because if you think about it, I could take this, right? And I could put it in a, in a ceramic jar for 2000 years and somebody could open up the jar, find this little piece of paper and they'd be like, how did they know? 2000 years ago, how did they know I would be reading this? <laughs> well, the idea of course is that it couldn't be any other way in that sense, that if it's just sitting there in a jar, it's like the proverbial tree in the woods that falls and nobody, nobody's there to hear it. So it's just sitting there. But there's a form of kind of, again, it's either magic or modern art <laughs> where when you, when you actually participate in this, there's an interesting thing that happens. And what I'm suggesting is, is that these Mahayana sutras that are so aware of themselves, I, there's a way in which they are in the second person, but they didn't know what your name was going to be. So they will just call you moonlight in that sense. Or if it's a different sutra and it's the Bodhisattva Avilokiteshvara, they didn't know what you were going to be called, so they're calling you Avilokiteshvara. Or Bodhisattva whatever. Or Bodhisattva. The idea is, is that you can begin to read all of these bodhisattvas that have all of these really big wild names, yes, you can think of them as historical personages and try to find evidence of their existing and do it that way. Or you can read the name of these bodhisattvas or a name like Moonlight as this kind of entity that exists solely within the book. And that when you are reading the book, there's a way in which moonlight comes alive. And you know what I'm getting at is sort of about reading, but reading's actually quite magical if you think about it. Like that there's these symbols on a page, but, and just from these kind of symbols, the mind can produce all of these images and things a whole story, all of these things from these just symbols on a page. And my feeling about the Mahayana Buddhist tradition is that they're quite savvy, like, I don't want to say writers, that they're definitely writers in that way, but these sutras are written in a way where they know they're going to be read and they understand what it means to read something. They understand the, what's going on in that. And so I'm sort of still developing this as a thesis or as an idea regarding Mahayana Sutras. But the idea for me is that it's a kind of technology that works on the reader in a way. And it works if you, well, if you kind of allow yourself to fall into the sutra a little bit in that way. In other words, if it's, if it's kind of in the second person, if you, if you kind of think of that as the call, then you can respond and you can get into kind of a call and response with these sutras in that way. And I really do think that, oh, I don't want that one. I really do think that when a sutra like this starts talking about itself, and starts talking about all of these gods, hearing this sutra, talking about the protagonist, 
moonlight hearing this sutra, there we're reading the sutra. <laughs> I'm reading it out loud. You you are hearing the sutra, and so there is an interesting potential for a collapsing there of time and space in a way where the where the that uh, not to sound too weird but where a sutra like this is about tonight it's like about this and again how did they know that we were going to get together and talk about this well <laughs> that's that's where the mystery lies but Hmm. Beautiful sentiment. Sky, beautiful sentiment. Okay. Any questions or ideas about any of that? I see ideas are already per popping up. So. So on, let's talk a little bit about past lives and reincarnation and all of that. So when it says, you know, when it pre presents this elaborate story or description of this past Buddha named Supreme and this king, and the king had these 500 sons, and then this king and the sons all offer the Buddha, who, whose name was Supreme, they offer him these gardens all these flowers, these canopies, these parasols, kind of umbrellas and all of that, right? And so it goes through this kind of elaborate story. And then the Buddha says to Moonlight, oh yeah, and that was you. You were that king in a past life, right? And <clears throat> again, without being too definitive, there is a, a way in which well, especially the Buddha eye, the, the Buddha eye can see past lives. The Buddha eye can see all of this. And so maybe the Buddha could see eons and kalpas and kalpas and kalpas ago where there was a Buddha named Supreme and a king, and that king eventually became moonlight. Maybe, maybe. But if you read it the way that I was presenting it, then it kind of gets, it's, it's very different regarding these past lives, because again, the sutra may not be talking about actual people in past lives, but again, I guess all I wanna suggest is that there's a way in which that Buddha named Supreme, that king named Joyful Voice and all of his parasols and all of that, yes, that may have been a historical event, but my feeling about it is that me reading that sutra, what is Buddha Supreme and the King and the offerings? Like the, it exists nowhere else. It's not a document of a historical event. It's an event that exists in the sutra. And when somebody, me in this case, comes along and like a genie in the bottle unleashes this story. And I just unleashed it on all of you. And there's a way in which that, that Buddha Supreme and that King exist in that story that I told. And so when I'm telling the story or when I'm reading the story, there's a way in which it's present. It has a sort of presence in our minds, a presence over the internet, a presence in real in a certain kind of reality and again you could think of this sutra as referring to historical events or you could take it seriously to where it's referring to itself as an event and me again me reading it unleashes the event and then things get even crazier then when you do the thing where you assume the role of moonlight you assume the role of the, the listener, if you will, because remember, the sutra is about moonlight, who asked the Buddha, how did you get all these lights? And then the Buddha told moonlight, 
ah, all of this stuff, <laughs> right? We are to understand that the Buddha told Moonlight all of this stuff. And then I just had the great opportunity to tell you all of that same stuff. So I got to play the role of the Buddha because I got to say the Dharma. I got to say the words. And you got to play the role of Moonlight because you got to sit and listen to it. So we just reenacted the, the sutra or in, enacted the sutra. Not reenacted, we enacted it, if you will. I, you know, again, I'm presenting this as a, as a way of understanding, not as the way, not definitive, but I really feel like if you start thinking this way, when you read Mahayana Buddhist sutras, you'll begin to notice what I notice that they all start to make a lot more sense when you read them not as historical documents, but as very interesting. Uh, again, I don't even know what to call that. If it's not a historical event, but it's like a, a potential event waiting in, in the book. Ideas about any of that? It's totally interactive. Um, my, the other go-to reference for me that I really enjoy is the, the German children's book by Michael Ende, The Never-Ending Story. So The Never-Ending Story is another beautiful version of this where it's about a little boy who's reading a book but the story starts speaking to him and kind of bringing him into the story in a really interesting way so i if you are familiar with the never ending story i sometimes jokingly call these the never ending dharma so okay um I did want to go back, so I wanted to read the section in full, which I got to do, but then I did want to go back and just mention a few things. So, where was it? Well, one thing I'll tell you that's interesting, and, and you know, take all of this for what it's worth with a grain of salt. So this is um, the section I read about the king giving all the gardens and the parasols to the Buddha. It's one section in the standard English translation where they just take stuff out left and right. And I don't know, again, I don't know their reason why they did it, but one of the things that they took out was this interesting description of do, 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 all of these, um, all the trees and all the different flowers that were um, in King, in the King's garden. He had all of these special trees and all of these special flowers. And a lot of these flowers were hard to track down. I had to get a lot of different dictionaries um, but what's kind of interesting about it is that a lot of them sound a little psychedelic, like a little, like they might have been a little, um, I don't know. So um, one of them definitely is sort of um, a, it basically would have been hemp or cannabis in that way. Another of them is a known kind of uh, quasi psychedelic in that way. So I don't know if there's a ref, if there's a relationship between the gardens that are being referenced and the nature of this sutra that's kind of trippy in that way. Just take that for what it's worth that they are references to some pretty wild trees in here, as well as flowers. Um, yeah, and then I think the other thing that I wanted to mention, because it fits in with the theme of tonight. Ah, uh, yeah, the Mike Crowley book is a good source for all of that. Absolutely. Um, so regarding the preaching or the teaching of this sutra, but the one in the story, right? 
it says that there are these various gods, right? Uh, the um, well, I don't need to find them exactly, but it talks about chakra, it talks about Brahma, it talks about Garuda kings and all these various heavenly beings. And it talks about all of them hearing this sutra, generating the will for enlightenment. So hearing the sutra, generating the will for enlightenment and receiving the prediction of their future enlightenment. So if, you, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you know these are standard themes in Mahayana sutras. Um, and so just to go over that again, because it's kind of very important, the gods or whoever, they hear this sutra and then they generate bodhicitta. So that's the first thing, common idea. Uh, and the generating of bodhicitta, so a lot of different terms for this. The, they call it the initial determination for enlightenment or generating bodhicitta, or there's a few other ways to put it. And, you know, there's no exact way to define this, but I'll try to give you a, a, the basic idea. But the basic idea of this generating bodhicitta is it's sort of about wanting to be a Buddha, but I, you know, not wanting to be a Buddha, but setting one's kind of sights on awakening, on full awakening of a Buddha. Not just the ending of my suffering, which was kind of the original offering of the Buddha. You got, got dukkha? Come over here. Here's some teachings for alleviating your dukkha. You want to know why you're suffering? Well, here's some answers. And so the early form of Buddhism, the kind of Hinayana, if you will, it was very, very, very focused on a particular technique for alleviating one's suffering and, and actually ending completely one's suffering. The Mahayana Buddhist tradition, and particular this idea of the determination for enlightenment, the main difference, and it's huge, the main difference is that it is not the determination to end one's own suffering. This is actually the determination to end all suffering of all sentient beings. And that's what Buddhas are in the business of doing is allevi alleviating the suffering of all beings. And if one makes that altruistic move, if one says, you know what? I get the Dharma and I see how it could help me out, but I think it would be much wiser if I helped everybody, if we everybody went kind of to Nirvana in that sense. And so that makes one a Bodhisattva. If one has that altruistic, turning of the heart, which is about everybody's enlightenment, not just one's own alleviation of suffering. So bodhisattva path in that sense is very different than the original path of Buddhism, which was really just a technique for working on one's own psychology, one's own emotions, and one's own suffering. So hearing a sutra like this, all of these gods develop this altruistic determination for complete awakening. And by the way, too, if I may, yeah, because I got a few minutes, the Bodhisattva makes this determination for enlightenment not exactly out of a, not exactly out of this deep sense of of altruism, as I was saying, it is altruistic, but it's partially driven by an, a, a, it's partially driven by wisdom that understands that there is no awakening until there is universal awakening, that it's all actually going to be put on hold for a while if we just all work on our individual suffering. And so 
there's a kind of a movement of wisdom in this that it's it again it, it isn't exactly this it would be very good of me and magnanimous of me if i were to help everybody that's not exactly how the bodhisattva comes at this generating a bodhicitta it's actually kind of a a a, a, wis, a wisdom move where there's an understanding that there just really isn't any individual ending of suffering so that's the bodhicitta which again puts one on the bodhisattva path and then these gods also then receive this uh, vyakaranya the prediction of enlightenment and this is another standard trope or something I, okay, so Sky mentions the, the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. I was going to mention at the beginning of the night, you know, all of Mahayana Buddhism is just elaborations on the Diamond Sutra. <laughs> it's all in the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, also known as the Diamond Sutra. Everything is in there. The generation of bodhicitta is in there. The prediction of enlightenment is in there. The, um, the, the self-referential nature of the sutra. The Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra is one of those sutras that is aware of itself as a sutra. And it's why it keeps telling the reader of the benefits of propagating the sutra so good looking out sky the vajra pranyaparamita sutra is the real the origin in my opinion of all of these themes that are in the mahayana buddhist tradition they even speak of the light in the vajra sutra as well so but i just wanted to say about the prediction of enlightenment so we've seen this in many of these sutras that i do on sunday nights and again, we are dealing with what would seem to be a kind of past life, future life idea. So remember, that's sort of the theme of tonight, of this session of this sutra. We're kind of dealing with this weird, you know, that was you in a past life and all of that. And by the way, in a future life, you're going to attain enlightenment. So... One of the things that I want to mention about this, because I don't think I've ever really said this, although I don't know, but I don't think I've ever said it at Dharma doors. So the uh, Vyakaranya, as it's called, the prediction of enlightenment, there is also in the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, the Vajra Sutra mentions the original. Vyakaranya. So the original prediction of enlightenment was when our Buddha, Shakyamuni, born Siddhartha Gautama, right? So the, the Buddha of our historical time frame, in a past life, kalpas and kalpas and kalpas and kalpas ago, that being who would become Siddhartha before they were a Buddha, they were a Bodhisattva. They were the Bodhisattva. They were an enlightenment seeker. And in this previous life of our Buddha, he was a wandering forest ascetic. And I think his name was Megha. Not quite sure. The Buddha did have a life where he was called Megha, and I think it was this life. But at that time, there was a Buddha named Dipankara, Dipankara, the lamplighter Buddha. Notice the name, the lamp lighting Buddha, right? So Dipankara, the lamp lighting Buddha, was in town. And there was this giant parade for the, the Buddha, Dipankara. And Megha, the wandering ascetic, heard that the Buddha was coming to town and he wanted to see a fully enlightened Buddha. And so he goes to the parade, he stands on the side of the road, 
And here comes the Buddha, here comes Dipankara. And Megha, the wandering ascetic, has this vision of the Buddha. And the, the story is that Dipankara was walking and was about to step in a large puddle of mud because it had rained the night before. And the wandering ascetic, who of course had not a shaped head because not a Buddha, not a Buddhist yet, but has this giant you know, mound of dreadlocks because they're a wandering ascetic. And part of that tradition was not to cut your hair. So he had this huge mound of dreadlocks and seeing the Buddha, Dipankara, about to step into the mud, Megha unfurled all of his dreadlocks and, and, a, and kind of offered for Dipankara to walk across his hair. And at that moment, Dipankara made a prediction and said, you will in a future life be called Shakyamuni and you will be a fully enlightened Buddha. And that was the prediction of our Buddha's enlightenment that happened, you know, 2,500 years ago, if you will. So the Vajra Sutra recounts that story, which you can find in the Jatakas. There's a collection of tales of the previous lives of the Buddha. They're called Jataka tales. You can find the Jataka tale about Dipankara, but the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra references it. And again, that's the first Vyakaranya. The thing about the prediction of enlightenment, though, that you it will someday be a fully enlightened Buddha. One of the things that I've never said, I think, in the Dharma doors is there's a very interesting parallel in the Hinayana. So if you're familiar with the early Buddhist tradition, represented by the modern Theravada schools, the modern Theravada schools and the Hinayana, they have a kind of a, a four-step process to enlightenment, or I should say a four-step process to the alleviation of suffering. These stages are called being a stream enterer, a shrotopana, being a chakra dagamin, a once returner, being an anagaman, a non returner, and then finally being an arhat, a, uh, a worthy one, literally is what arhat means, but an arhat is someone who has ended suffering. So they have put out the flame of desire and no, don't have the dukkha anymore. So those four stages stream enterer is when you first sign up. And you're like, I want to be a Buddhist. Let's do this. I want to end my suffering. I want to end my rebirth. You have entered the stream. Then what would happen is that based upon your meditations, based upon your various samapati, your accomplishments, the Buddha would basically say, oh, you're only, you're only coming back one more time. You're, you're a Shakodagaman. Oh, you're not even coming back anymore. You're just going to be reborn in a kind of a heavenly abode to finish out your practice. And then you'll be an arhat. So you're an anagaman. You're not even coming back here anymore. Or the Buddha would say, you're an arhat. You're a worthy one now. You've ended your suffering. That was the schematic in the early Buddhist tradition. The thing I've never said is, is that this whole initial determination of enlightenment and then the prediction that you'll be a Buddha, that's kind of the Mahayana Buddhist equivalent of the four fruits, as they're called. So those are the four fruits, the stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, arhat. The Mahayana tradition doesn't talk about the four fruits. They actually don't even really like to talk much about arhats. The Mahayana tradition talks about bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas have made the initial determination for enlightenment. 
and bodhisattvas eventually receive their prediction of enlightenment from a Buddha and then become fully awakened beings. There's a very, very close parallel between these two. They're both talking about that initial movement. And by the initial movement, I'm talking about going from like just, you know, uh, bad habits after bad habits after bad habits after bad habits. And then you're finally like, you know what? I want to break this cycle of bad habits. Boom. Like to make the decision to change your life in that way, that's a movement. It's a very, very important movement. And so in the early Buddhist tradition, they would call that entering the stream. You've decided to go against the stream of your habits. You've decided to go against the stream of habituation. In the Mahayana tradition, they describe that as your initial determination for enlightenment. So I just want you to know that that, like, that decision to change your ways is very important. And in one tradition, they kind of refer to it one way. In another, they refer to it a different way. And then there's this idea of where this leads. So after I've made the decision to change my life, what does it mean? Where does changing my life lead? And in the early Buddhist tradition, it leads to being an arhat. It leads to the cessation of suffering, as I was saying, your suffering individually. The Mahayana path, the, the Bodhisattva path, it ends in the fully enlightened state as a Buddha, as an awakened being. The thing about the difference between these two, and up, oh, I got to make this quick. So there's a lot of different ways to interpret these differences between these two, but I'll give you the one main one that I can think of. From, from the Mahayana Buddhist point of view, which is founded on this teaching of emptiness and a premier aspect of the teaching of emptiness is the emptiness of the self, of the individual in that way. That is the ultimate highest pranya, the ultimate highest insight realization in that sense is this emptiness of the self. And the idea, of course, is, is that it is just actually an illusion, a, a, just a, a delusion, that sense of self. It's just a delusion. And it's a delusion that we're deeply in the belief structure of. But the idea is, is that it actually isn't at all. So from a Mahayana point of view, when they look at the early tra tradition and, and they hear about a once returner or a non-returner, meaning you're, you don't have any more reincarnations, the Mahayana tradition is like, time out. There's nothing that gets reincarnated anyways. That's the realization. So what are, what's all of this once return or non-returner? It doesn't even, it's just reinforcing a notion that we're actually trying to get over. So I would suggest that part of the movement away from that fourfold, four fruit structure and towards the, the just bodhicitta, full awakening as a Buddha, the difference is, is that the bodhisattva version, it's done in a way that attempts to not reinforce the self that is understood to be illusory. And so that's, therein lies the wisdom realization of the Bodhisattva that, oh yeah, there's no, <laughs> awakening is not what we thought it was. And so we need to go about this a different way. And so we're never going to get there alone in a cave. We will always only get there in a way together. It's the only way. And so that's sort of the, that Bodhisattva version. So, all right, I'm gonna call it there because it's 8.30. Apologies about that, just cutting it off there at the end, but we are not 
by any means done with this sutra. So there is more to come next week. So stay tuned. <laughs>